Glory and honor and worship belongs to you, O Lord God. Amen. Amen. You may have your seats. You may have your seats. God bless you. Welcome, everybody, to the Redemption House. My name is Moyo, and um, I am the youth leader, uh, and today is Facts of Life. Uh, it's a very special Sunday. Um, not a lot of people like to admit it, but it's everybody's favorite Sunday, uh, where the young adults take over the service. Have we had a great start to the service so far? Have we had a great start to the service so far? Come on, I can't hear. Y'all don't sound too confident this morning. Have you had a great start to the service so far? God bless you. As you can see, uh, we like to have a little bit of fun here at the house. Uh, we have a theme. That is a loud instrument. <laughs> what is it called? Shekhar, wow. It's, it's a powerful, it's a powerful, powerful instrument. I love it. I love it. So, um, yeah, as you can see, today's theme is uh, Plaid Sunday. You got your best plaid shirts on. I see that some of you guys have uh, them on. Uh, and thank you for uh, um, abiding. I mean, it's not necessary. It's not mandatory. But it's just something that we like to do to, have a, to, to just kind of keep things light uh, here in the Redemption House. And um, so how's everyone feeling this morning? We good? Awesome. We good? Awesome. Are we better than good? Are we great? We happy to be in church this morning? Yes. Oh, not a lot of yeses on that one. Are we happy to be in church this morning? Yes. Would you rather be in bed this morning? No. I almost got you with that one. All right, God bless you. You can remind me last week's, not last week, sorry, rather last month's FOL topic. Anyone know? Anyone know? Who remembers last month's? Oof, you guys aren't rewatching your... Si sorry? No, no, that's not the theme, the, the message. Last month's message. It's because you won. That's why you know the, the theme. <laughs> what was last last month's topic? Anybody? Anybody except for Pastor? Because obviously we all know he's he's gonna know. He's anointed. He has that anointing upon him. Nobody really? Oh man. Oof. oof. I'm the. I'm sorry, Uncle Roy. The law. Are you referring to me as a lawyer, or I don't get it? What was last last month's topic? Anybody know? Sorry. The law. That's it. Just that. The law. Ah. Uh, no, 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 that's not it. All right, give yourselves a round of applause nevertheless. Give yourselves a round of applause. I know. You, yes, you can, you can no, get a little bit better than that. You give yourselves a round of applause. You got, you got 50%, all right? So in this country, 50% is considered a pass. I've seen many 50% in my um, educational career, so believe me, you know, you pass. So that's, and my mom wasn't happy with those marks, but, you know, as far as I was concerned, I got a pass. That's all I, that's all I could care about, to be honest with you. The last month's topic was the law versus grace, right? So, what, so just a bit of a recap, what I essentially did last month was that we kind of dissected the myth that the law is no longer a valid entity for Christians to follow. Just because, you know, a lot of Bible, uh, especially in the New Testament, Paul especially references in the New Testament that we are no longer under law, but now under what? So therefore, there's a myth within the Christendom that we, don't lo we no longer have to abide by the ways of the law from the Old Testament, because some of us might even argue that it's a bit of an archaic thing to follow. The laws back then don't apply to today. So one of my uh, one of my um, attentions for last month was to essentially dispel that notion, and I was and I'm here to talk about a different revelation that was revealed to me in preparation for today. And it's still upon the topic of the law versus grace. So today's topic, we may want to remember this for perhaps next month, is the law versus grace, part two. Amen. 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 So there's a new revelation that the Holy Spirit ministered to me in preparation for today. And that's something that I, I, I failed to touch on in last month's message. And it's still in line with the whole aspect and the fact that the law is still a very valid, uh, a very valid component of our faith and our walk in Christ today. Amen. And we're just here to just essentially dissect that. And I have a bit of a case study today. You know, um, we've been reading, you know, we've been doing our Bible recap and there's... The, uh, there's, there's a couple of Bible verses or Bible books rather that I'm still kind of stuck on that Holy Spirit has been ministering to me and I'm still essentially dissecting and it's the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus and I want to do a bit of a case study on Moses. Anyone know who Moses is? Anyone? For those who may not know, a bit of a preamble, Moses is considered by some people the great, one of the greatest prophets in history. He was the individual that was tasked with the duty of leading the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt and bringing them into the promised land. As a matter of fact, Moses was responsible for communicating directly with God. And this is why a lot of people see him as one of the greatest prophets ever, because he literally spoke directly with God. He had face-to-face -face conversations with his maker. That's what made Moses is so special and because of that he was able to essentially deliver the laws 
to the people. So Moses was one of the first individuals, if not the only individual for that matter, that put the laws on tablets in this in today's case I guess paper or iPads or iPhones or whatever the case may be to kind of like kind of kind of modernize it so we're going to do a bit of a case study to kind of you know further dissect that whole component between the law versus grace and we're going to talk about Moses is it okay if I get it get into it a little bit with the Bible can I do that this morning technical team you have the Bible verses on deck can I get a thumbs up? Because I'm, I'm going to rely on you today. I do not have my glasses, so I'll, I'll definitely have to be looking at the screen for, for, the, uh, for the Bible verses. Let's quickly open to the book of Hebrews 3.5. In the book of Hebrews 3.5, we see that Moses was accounted to be a faithful servant of God. He was extremely faithful and diligent because of his strong obedience to God. Whenever God asks of, uh, something of Moses, he never shied away. I mean... To be fair, in the beginning, he did shy away, but he was very adamant on ensuring that God's work was done as per his instruction. So Hebrews 3.5 says, Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God will reveal later. Look, uh, let's, you know, I'm not going to touch on it today, but that's a little bit of a nugget right there. If you, some, some call it an Easter egg. It's a bit of a revelation to the future of what is to come in the form of Jesus Christ. But I'm, I can't get into it today, perhaps maybe another time. But essentially, what I want to take out of that Bible passage is that Moses was accounted for being extremely faithful. His faithfulness was born out of his diligence and, and adhering to all of the instructions that God had revealed to him. Amen? Now, we kind of see throughout the book of Deuteronomy, and or actually when Moses gets into the picture in the Old Testament, we kind of see a bit of an evolution. Sorry, if I, I know I'm sweating a lot. You know, I haven't drummed and come uh, to come drums to, to the stage right away. It's, uh, it's, it's a new thing. I'm kind of huffing and puffing underneath my breath. So just bear with me if I, <sighs> you hear a little bit, <laughs> you hear deep breaths underneath um, myself as I'm talking this morning. But we kind of see an evolution in Moses' approach from when he started to when, you know, he passed away. The way Moses related with God kept going, it kept going in a trajectory that kept going upwards and upwards. He, he grew in confidence in the way he communicated with God, right? So, for example, in Exodus 19.3, we see that uh, the Bible says that Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. That wasn't always the case. Moses never had that privilege in the beginning to, um, to go see God and, uh, directly. As a matter of fact, during Moses' journey as, a, as Israel's leader, again, like I mentioned, we see the evolution and we see how timidity now gets transformed into confidence, especially in the way he relates to his heavenly father. Um, I want to quickly just touch on the book of Exodus 3, where we read about Moses' first encounter with God. This is the first time ever that Moses actually sees, or no, not sees, but um, encounters and speaks with God. Ex Exodus 3, um, the beginning, just um, the big beginning verses, if you can just put it up. I don't think I actually put that in, the, in my email to you guys, but that's uh, my apologies. But in essence, in the beginning of Exodus 3, Moses speaks with God in the form of a burning bush. And... Throughout the, dial the, the dialogue between Moses and, you know, and God, God tells him, listen, you know, I am, he introduces himself, I am that I am. He gives him a, a plethora of all his names. And he tasks Moses with the duty of what? Leading the Israelites out of slavery. Anyone remember what Moses' immediate response was when he asked him, when God asked him to do that, du that, that duty? Anyone know what God said? I mean, Moses said? If you're confident, you better say it this morning. Amen? It Sorry? He says he stammers. That he's not the most, he's, he, Moses essentially disqualified him from the assignment that God had brought to him. He said, God, I am not really the best candidate for this task to which you have bestowed upon me. Ask someone else. And then you know what happened? How did God respond? Anyone remember? Okay, I'll give you a little bit of, I'll, I'll, I'll inform you. Sorry? What was God's response to Moses' first response? God says, it doesn't matter. I will tell you what to say. When you go and approach Pharaoh and tell them, release my people, tell Pharaoh that I am that I am has sent you to do this. I am here to back you. I am backing you. You have my backing. You have my authority. There's nothing that can stop you. As long as I am with you, nobody can be against you. What was Moses' response? No, I don't think it's me. I don't think I'm the one. I don't think I'm suited out for this. Eventually, a little bit of back and forth ensued between Moses and, and God to the point where Moses eventually caved in and said, you know what? I will go, however, please make sure that my brother Aaron is my mouthpiece. In other words, I st I'll just do the, you know, the physical aspects. I'll do the miracles. Let, let, let Aaron talk. I'm still not confident in my abilities to essentially grasp what you expect of me as you have given me these tasks. Now, that was Moses' first encounter. Later on, we now begin to see that Moses now is bold in his approach to God. 
we read about Moses literally sitting face to face with God. In the book of Exodus 19, 3, it says that Moses climbed the mountain. This is Mount Sinai. He declared the mountain to what? Appear before God. I don't believe that that's ever been done before. Until now. We've, had, we've heard of encounters with angels. We've, had, we've heard encounters with God-like, you know, individuals that have encounters with, for example, Jacob, Abraham as well, uh, encountered God in the, in the form of the three angels that came to tell him that Sarah will be pregnant. And what, did, what, did, what was Abraham's response then? He laughed. Or Sarah laughed, actually. But we see that he appeared before God, literally God, Yahweh, I am that I am. The Lord called him from the mountain and said, give these instructions to the family of Jacob, announce it to the descendants of Israel. Now, the timidity between God and Moses is, is, is now slightly evaporating, and now he's a bit more confident. That evolution is very key because we kind of see a transformation in Moses' character to how he deals and relates to God. And there's one thing I quickly want to point out just because, you know, it's going to be a short one today. I, well, I'm going to try to keep within time. If you read the whole journey of the Israelites from Egypt to the promised land, you know that Moses was not the only one that encountered God in a unique way. You guys know that, right? Y'all don't believe me, do you? The Israelites as well encountered God. These were individuals or people, a group of people that knew God, that not, well, not necessarily knew God, that encountered God in ways no other culture, no other people, no other population had the privilege of encountering God. They saw the Red Sea split in half so that they can walk through and then close up and then swallow their enemies. They've seen quail, birds, literally fly from, the, from just from a cyclone, a tornado, if you will, a, 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 a hurricane of quail go from come from the east side for them to eat they've experienced manna appear out of nowhere when they were hungry they've seen water come out of rocks they've seen moses immerse himself in god's presence as he went up mount sinai and disappeared they have seen god appear in the form of a pillar by fire by night and a pillar of clouds by day these are massive significant encounters with God that we should not look over but yet why was it that the relationship between Moses and God vastly was different there's a huge discrepancy between the relationship between Moses and the Israelites as a matter of fact you know my wife and I always joke about how um we kind of get annoyed reading the book of Deuteronomy into Leviticus and I, I you know I'm gonna just be completely I'm not a pastor I'm not called to be perfect so I'm just gonna be completely transparent today um yes I find it annoying that Constantly, constantly. Okay, let me actually ask you guys. Have you ever read the book of Deuteronomy into Leviticus and think to yourself, I think I've read this passage already. And you look backwards and say, I think, I, I'm pretty sure I already read this. Anyone ever encountered that before? Yeah? Why is that? Anyone want to share why that is? That why you think you have, like you're kind of going through? Okay, can we get a mic, please? I want one person at a time. Now we're, now we're alive, eh? All right, can we get a mic? I, I think I have, no, someone took it. So who wants, to, who wants to share why they think that there's a bit of repetition going on when they read the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy? Anyone? Don't be shy because there's a mic now. Let's hear it. Raise your hand if you want to just give a quick, come on, guys. Okay, we got some hands in the back. Let's go. AY, AY, let's go. Sorry to snap at you. I'm, I'm sorry. It's, it's a bad habit. <laughs> Who's that? Who's going to talk? Oh, AY. <laughs> keep your hands up high. Keep your hands up high. Um, it was a it was a recap of everything that had happened in Exodus. Who is that in the back? Who's that spot? Can someone tell me who's speaking at the back? <laughs> is that my wife? Hello. You look good, girl. Okay, so there's a bit of a recap continuously happening. Anyone else want to give a bit of a a, a bit of a, um, a bit of a um, contribution as well? Go ahead. Just a reminder to the children of Israel about everything that's happened. So what I'm gathering from what you both have said, and you're both, give them a round of applause, please give them a round of applause, give them a round of applause. Come on, don't, come on, you can do better than that. You had your chance to talk, and they were the ones that took, that took, that took the opportunity. What I'm gathering from that, essentially what you both have said is that there's a bit of repetition consist consistently going through in these books whereby God, Moses, whoever is constantly reminding the Israelites of the laws to which he gave them over and over and over again, yet they did not care to listen. And I'll tell you something, I don't believe that the Israelites did not know the law because if someone repeats something to me over and over and over again, the least I can do is acknowledge it. But the reason why they didn't, they were unable to follow or, 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 or at least be obedient in a consistent manner was because there was no relationship between the Israelites and God during that time period. There was no connection. They had no reason to connect to the law. 
if you can't connect with something, if you don't have a strong relationship with something, it doesn't matter how often someone tells you about what, what you're supposed to do. You won't really care for it. I'm ashamed to give this example. Any of us have ever, you don't have to raise your hands, you know, we're being, we're being filmed, but I'll, I'll be the scapegoat for this one. Have you, have you ever got an email from, you know, your boss or a colleague at like 4.45 p.m. and then you read it, they're asking you to do a task, and you think to yourself, that sounds like a Monday problem. You just put it away in a little file somewhere. Anyone done that before? Yeah? Why? There was an instruction given to you, but why weren't you keen on doing it? Because your heart's not really immersed with that instruction. Your heart's somewhere else. Maybe it's at home, thinking about what you're gonna get for dinner. Thinking about, oh, is, is, is Ellie ready? Will he, will he give me troubles when I go pick him up from daycare? Because the Israelites also interacted with God as well. Well, through Moses, to be fair. But, you know, there's, there's a particular instance that I actually want to read about, and we're going to go through the, the scriptures to kind of um, dissect it a little bit, whereby the Israelites, and this is, again, a bit of a preamble for those who may not be too familiar. Essentially, the Israelites have now left Egypt. They are on the cusp of entering the promised land, Canaan. And then they were, had, uh, Moses had instructed spies to go to Canaan to essentially survey the land to ensure that, you know, Everything was good for the taking, as God has promised. And then the, the spies came back and gave what? A bad report. They said that there were giants there. No, what, what they said first essentially was that, you know, the land is great. Mwah. Land of flowing of milk and honey, grapes the size of my head. There's food in abundance. This is the perfect place for us to essentially settle. But the people there are giants. They, are, they will crush us. We don't have the ability to take over this land. It'll be a failed mission. And you know what? Something that I always, that always bugs me about that report is if these people were so mighty and strong, how did you little people sneak into their land, survey their areas, go into all of their key, their key vegetation and agricultural facilities, and then return unscathed? How does that work? If they're, if they're so big and bad, how did you escape and how did you get in and get out without, without any issues? But anyway, they brought the bad reports and then I want us to... Um, you know, quickly read the book of the Exodus 14, 11, 12, uh, 11, 2, 12, rather. And, you know, after, so when these guys brought the bad reports, the Israelites complained and complained. They said something along the lines of, oh, my days, Moses, you brought me out of Egypt for us to just die. It would have been better if we just stayed slaves in Egypt or we just died in the wilderness. This is unacceptable. This is, you know, we, we, what, what are we doing here, essentially? And this is God's response to Moses. God says, um... I can't have my glasses. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the, in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us uh, out of Egypt? Again, a question. And then it goes, they go on to say, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Can I get um, NLT, please? That was a bit of a tongue twister. Um, so yeah, in essence, these are the Israelites complaining to Moses, right? And then God, I, I think I gave, I, and then I, later on, I think a little bit further down, God responds to Moses and said, hey, listen, these guys are kind of like, you know, they're, they're, they're not being serious right now. They've essentially are spitting in my face. They've seen what I've done for them. They don't care enough to even acknowledge how far I have brought them. And essentially they're being ungrateful. Here I am leading them into what I promised them and time and time and time again they've essentially showed me that they do not know me. It's a, it doesn't say that specifically but that's, that's, a, that's a conclusion that one can make. Because if they knew God, they would have known that this God can easily get them into the land of Canaan. There was no connection with God. So that's why, that's where the fear, that's where the doubt, that's where the, 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 the uncertainty that God can actually do what God said he would do comes from. And then God was upset. He was ready to just wipe them all out. So remember, we're, basically, Israelites have, have made a position to God, essentially stating that you've brought us here to die. We wanted to go into the wilderness, I mean, to the um, promised land, but it's something that you aren't able to do. Now, let's look at Moses' um, response uh, uh, to God's displeasure in the book of Exodus 14, 13 to 17. Exodus 14, verse 13 to 17. Moses says, but Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. No, that's not the verse. That's not the passage. That is not the passage. Exodus 14, 13 to 17.
Sorry, just bear with me. I think I may have given you guys the wrong one. That is my apologies. It is coming. I think it's Exodus 32, verse 30 to 33. I believe that that's what I wanted to say instead. My apologies, everyone. You guys forgive me? Sorry about that. A little bit of technical difficulties. No, this, that's not it either. Okay, we'll, we'll get to it. If anyone can please find it. Basically, Moses responds to what the Israelites said earlier. And Moses said to God, essentially, listen, I know, what you, I know that you're upset right now. I know that the Israelites have gotten you annoyed. They're pretty much showing that they're, they're, they're not able to, uh, to, to believe in you. They're, they're displeased with the actions to which that they have. Uh, it's, it's, you're justified. He's telling God you're justified in your displeasure with the Israelites this, this, uh, this to the today with respect to them coming into the land of Canaan. But there's something that Moses said that kind of like, you know, kind of struck fear into my heart because I was, I was kind of like thinking to myself, how was Moses able to talk to God like this? Right? How is he able? Sorry, I think. Yeah, so Exodus 14, 13 to 17. Ex is that the same passage we just read? Okay, so I don't know how. No, I. Mm. 32, 11. Okay, perhaps that was the mistake on my end. Let's go to 32, 11. I just want to read it. 32, 11, I think it should be, I want to read from 13 to 17. That's, that would be Moses' response. My apologies. Perhaps this might be it. Um, then Moses pleaded with the Lord. Thank you. God bless you, Uncle Rotimi. Give him a round of applause. Give him a round of applause. Um, then Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? I was just kind of dissecting the way Moses was correlating with God in this, in this passage because I was, in my head I was almost like, does, can he talk to God like that? He's kind of like almost challenging. Like he's almost saying like, why are you like, what's the big deal? Like, why are you so upset? You know, I always thought that when you approach God, you're supposed to approach God with a lot of reverence, a lot of, oh God, I'm here to, you know, let me cover my face. Let me hide my face. So again, this is a bit of a first clue into God's, uh, not God, sorry, Moses' confidence in the way he corresponds with God. Let's go to the next verse, please. Um, next verse, verse 12. Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Now it almost sounds like he's giving God instructions. Almost. And it's almost like a bit of a tease, a challenge. Like, what do you mean? Like, you, you, I mean, what's the big deal? You, you've, shown your, you've shown you're powerful. You brought them this far. So what's the, what's the big idea? Like, what's the, what's the um, in essence, what's the worry? Or what's, what, what, what's the big deal? Why are you so upset? Like, why are you mad, bro, kind of thing? That you're going to now bring them in, that, you, that they're, they're acting this way. The next verse, I think the la that'll be the last verse. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self. Now he's, remind he's reminding God of his own words. This is a converse. Has anyone talked to God like this before? I, I shudder at the thought to even to do so. And he says, I will, and then he um, self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of, of and I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So it goes on to just Moses essentially almost telling God, you said you were going to do this. You made this promise. And if you were to stop now, your enemies will look at you and say you couldn't do it because you killed the Israelites uh, in, the, in the wilderness and didn't bring them to Canaan. He pretty much said the Egyptians will essentially be happy and joyous in our failure of making it to the promised land because it will almost show you as incapable of doing what you said you would do. Amen? And I thought to myself, how is, how is this guy getting away with this kind of talk? Because then God responds and says, you know what? He agreed with them. He said, you know what? You're right. I've heard, I've heard your plea. I will, not, I, will, I will keep my promise. However, these lot that have complained, they will not see the promised land. That's the bare minimum I'm going to do. That's the best I'm going to do. But I've heard you, and I will continue accordingly. God complied to Moses' plea, and I was shocked. I'm telling you, like, I would dare not even speak to I wouldn't speak to my dad like that, yet alone God. But how was Moses able to get away with this? The best way I think I can rationalize that conversation, you know, a, a few times people have come up to me, especially Uncle T. I remember we were, we were just kind of like, you know, hanging out, him and I. And um, he pretty much was like, Moyo, I, I, know, I know you love your sister. I know you guys are, you know, it's very clear that you guys have a strong relationship. But it's just kind of funny the way you, you know, 
you, 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 you guys relate to each other. It's a very, you know, cat and mouse kind of relationship. You know, sometimes I, I tease her. I, you know, take little jabs here or there at her. And, you know, he was always wondering, like, I know you love her, but I just find it like, you know, because I guess maybe for him, he's very, a lot, he's always 100 emotional with his, with his own siblings, perhaps, I don't know. Perhaps, maybe that's a bit of a foreign thing for him, but it was kind of interesting, and this, he's not the only one that said this to me in the past. Others have essentially said, Moyo, like, the way you and your sister relate is quite interesting. You guys are always, like, kind of getting at each other. Well, I'll tell you something. The reason why I am able to get away with these little, you know, jabs here and there with my sisters because we have developed a very strong relationship that I have earned the right to speak to her in that way, and she under... <laughs> Because don't nobody can talk to sis like the way I do. Because I promise you, anybody try to do what I do with my sister or correlate or correspond with her the way I do. Toby and I are riding at dawn. We're bringing the bats. What are you talking about? That's little sis right there. I know. Oh, okay. Okay, there. It's at the cat's out of the bag. I love my sister. There. Okay, I'm, I'm, tempt, I'm finding really hard not to make, a, make an insult right now. <laughs> not to tease her. But that's the point. We have earned, and I'm sure it's just not me and her. I'm sure some of us have. I mean, I've seen some friends that when they say hi to each other, it's just nothing but absolute insults. And it's like, what's going on here? I thought you guys were pals. But because they have developed a strong connection, they know that if he's talking to me or speaking to me this way, he doesn't mean it. He or she doesn't mean it, and we are actually still close. We have developed a strong bond. He knows, I know my sister, I know what, nobody, uh, maybe Toby can now, but nobody can, I, I, know the, I know the buttons to push to get her, you know, upset. And she knows my buttons to push. So even though we're teasing each other, when it's time to be serious, I can look at her dead in the eye and say, Ife, you know, cut it out. Jokes aside, it's time to really, you know, let's have a heart to heart. And she knows, and vice versa. Because we've developed that strong bond, we know each other so well. Ife and I can look at each other and we know exactly what we're thinking. We've been, so I, was, I always say this all the time. There are certain times when Ife is playing the piano and we may not have even ever practiced, but before she gets to the next part she wants to play, as far as the piano goes, I already know where she's going because we built that relationship. It's been worked on for years and years and years and years. And to the glory of God, nobody has been able to break that bond. Amen? So that's kind of how I see it with Moses and God. Moses has been relating to God for so many, so for, for quite a long time to the point where we see his timidity in the beginning. There's a burning bush. He was scared. God even tells him, and I don't know, the Bible doesn't really record this, but remember, what does God to ask Moses to do when he, he encounters the burning bush? Did anybody know? What does God tell Moses to do first? Someone, someone has their hand up. Can we get him a mic? No, no, I want hands up. You guys better speak in the mic. It's, it's, a, bit of a, it's a bit of a cop out. Somebody's out there. Go ahead. Move your sandals because where you're standing is a holy place. God bless that. God bless you, young man. God bless you, young man. There's that reverence. See, that relate. that's what I thought the consistent relationship between Moses and God would be. Whenever Moses goes, oh, God, here I am, taking off my shoes, taking off, covering my head, that I'm covering my, my face. But no, it was always, it didn't always stay that way. Literally, Moses asked God, hey, God, I want to see you. I want to see you face to face. You've brought me this far. You've literally brought me to, to where I am today. The best, I, the least you can do is give me your glory. And what does God do? He says, I can't show you everything, but the best I can do is I can, I, we don't have time to go through the Bible passage, so I do apologize. I can turn my back and you can see my back in all of its glory. And God also furthermore says that my glory is so powerful that I won't be, that, that, that it won't be best for you to see it because it'll potentially harm you. So what I'm going to do is the Bible literally says, God covered, used his hand to cover Moses' face. His hand, God's hand touched him. And then as God was walking away, he removed his hand and Moses was able to see the backside of God. The confidence was now there to even make such a request. The relationship was built. Amen? Okay, so that's the case study. Why do I bring this up? We br I brought this up because we've seen a... Am I did I make sense, by the way? We've seen a transformation of how Moses relates to God from the beginning to before he passed away. God expects a transformation when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. When you accept him as king... 
You cannot do or act the same way you were before. You are a new creature. The Bible in the book of Romans 12, 2 says, don't, and again, NLT, it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God, what? Transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know. So once you are changed, once you've transformed yourself, you will learn to know God's will. Once Moses was transformed, he knew how to correspond with God without worrying about God's wrath. There was a connection there. Amen? Amen. Which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's a reference to God's will. Transformation is key. Now, how do we relate that to the law? How do we relate that to grace? The law can't transform you. The law in its, in its rigid obedience of same is not capable of transforming you. It's only by grace, as the Bible says, that you are renewed. And in order for you to be renewed, you are a new creature. And in order for you to become a new creature, how do you get transformation? You have to connect with God. You have to build a firm and strong relationship with your maker. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to give you a bit of my, I'll give my own testimony. If I may, can I share a little private story with you today, or personal, I should say? Can I do that? Is it okay if I share with you guys this morning? I, wanna, I don't have to say it. I can, we can just end it right here. Can I share? Okay. <laughs> I'm obviously joking. <laughs> so, a long time, and again, Pastor, we might lose some people in the chats today. Some people might, you know, we might lose people today because of what I'm about to say. I'm about to talk about a very controversial topic, and it could be a bit divisive. So, for those who may be... Um, who may be triggered by what I'm about to say. I apologize. Um, I've looked at the roster. This is probably my last FOO message for the year. Come back next week. Pastor will be back. So, you know, we could go carry on. But this is something that ties to me and my own personal relationship with God. So just bear with me as I give it. I'm going to talk about tithing. Ooh. Don't be scared. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. I'm going to talk about tithing. Once upon a time, a while ago, I, gave, I made a promise to God. I don't know where this came from. I think, okay, I'll tell you how. It was born out of, randomly, I came into some money. By the way, it wasn't a lot of money. It was like $200. I mean, in today's economy, that's a lot of money. But back then, it was, you know, I was in high school. So $200 to me back then was a lot of money. And, you know, I think I had heard about tithing or someone had preached to me about tithing. And I just thought to myself, all right, you know, let's you give this tithing thing a go. I mean, I really wanted to buy some sneakers with this $200, but let me give 10% of that. And then I gave my 10% and I realized that the money I had left over was enough to buy like three pairs of sneakers. And I was like, okay. So the tithing didn't really affect much. I was still able to provide for myself. So I made that decision moving forward that I will always tithe irrespective of the financial situation that I find myself in because I had connected with the shoes <laughs> and, 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 the, and the abundance therein that I, that I was able to purchase. So ever since then, you know, when I, I just kept tithing and I just kept seeing God's hand move. He was present in every single thing that I did. He was just so loving. I, I, I experienced miracles and blessings that I can never even like, I could never even imagine was possible. Listen, guys, I financially speaking, Uncle Tony has said this in the past. He said that people always say numbers don't lie. They lie when God is involved because it makes no sense why I'm always giving and giving and giving, but yet I'm always, you know, having an abundance and abundance and abundance. I was, I was speaking to my wife the other day and I just opened my fridge and I saw how much, I mean, and I'm not trying to brag, so please forgive me if I sound um, a bit braggadocious this morning. I'm just giving you, I'm just telling you what God has done in my life and I'm just here to review, to, to, to testify his goodness over my life. I opened my fridge and my fridge was full and I said thank you Jesus because it, like we go to the grocery store you buy a pack of Gatorade and, and, and chewing gum and it's $85.99 how's my fridge still full and the most important part time of when I saw God's hand so strong was when my wife and I put we signed an agreement of purchase and sale to buy a pre-construction property that was going to be our permanent residence we put down the initial deposit and then leading up to us closing on that home what happened the next day after signing you anyone want to guess COVID. 
And then because of COVID, there was all this news and all of this, you know, the pre-construction market went in up, practically up into flames. There were builders talking about we can't close no more because there's no labor. Uh, interest rates just drastically started going up. We had we had initially locked in a good um, interest rate with our bank. And then our bank was a banker started telling us saying things like, well, if you guys don't close by this date, I can't hold it for you. And you'll have to be subject to this interest rate. And boy, was that interest rate high. In all that worry, I kept tithing. Because I know God, because I, I know God was was still with me. I remember even talking to Uncle Tony. I asked him, "Hey, listen, this is kind of your industry here. I'm hearing X, Y, and Z that builders are kind of acting kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of interesting with these transactions. And one thing is he here? Is Uncle Tony here? If you can, no, he's not here. But uh, he's outside. No worries. So, but one, the first thing that Uncle Tony told me when I sent him this text, he sent me a voicemail. I don't know what prompted him to do that because he never sends voicemails. He just responds with text. Does he? Yeah, he never. He said, first of all, Moyo, you are a child of God, so you will not be affected by this." It's okay, I'll, I'll clap for myself. That was the first thing he told me. And you know what my response in my heart was? I didn't say this, but my first one was like, oh yeah, 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 I get that, yeah. But so anyway, am I, am I good or not? Is, is this gonna kind of affect us? Because interest rates were going bananas and we, there was no, we, were no, we were not confident that we were able to close the transaction, we would have enough funds. I remember my wife and discussing, we were saying we might have to borrow money from the parents, whatever the case may be. Within that period of time, God gave me a promotion. God gave me a new job that was paying more. I was able to put down the rest of the down payment on my own without borrowing from anybody. Glory be to God. My wife and I moved into our home and again, I kept tithing. Within a week of moving into our brand new home, we were excited. We were glorious. We were so happy. Glory be to God. It was the day of my son's birthday after I moved in. I said, you know, baby, I'm going to have a quick meeting at the office. I'm going to go to the office. I'm going to have this meeting. I'm going to run back home, and we're just going to celebrate LEL for his first birthday. I went to the meeting. Moyo, here's your pink slip. We've let you go. A month, not even a month, sorry, a week into buying a brand new home, I got to worry about mortgage, I got to worry about bills, I got to worry about my son, I got to worry about my wife, I got to worry about all of these things, and immediately... Funds were gone. Let me tell you something. My severance that they gave me, I paid tithe on that nevertheless. I was not making income still, but I trusted God so much that I knew he would come through for me. The next job I got, I managed to get another job, and essentially it wasn't paying as much as I initially would have liked. It was actually paying a little, a little bit less than I, I was getting paid a little bit less than I thought. But nevertheless, bills were being paid. We never went into the red. Mortgage never, we never got any calls from RBC telling us that, oh, by the way, we may have to foreclose on your home because you're not paying our, uh, the mortgages. And the care was paid. In power was paid. All the bills were still paid. I, I can't tell you how, how this happened. And this is the thing that really, really struck me that my wife um, brought, uh, brought to my attention a couple of days ago. We were going through our finances right and my wife said listen Moyo did you notice something I'm like what did you like what, what do I what do I notice she said since I started working as a professional I've never worked a full year because every time I started the school year working some jerk knocked me up and I'll have to go on maternity leave <laughs> I, don't, I don't God bless that jerk by the way so she never worked Oh my God, y'all aren't hearing me. She doesn't get in an income for the past two years of us owning our home. Okay, she was on EI. Okay, fair enough, she was on EI. All right, everyone go live off of EI then. and see how that works out for you. What was that? We're not even, why are you exposing my wife like that? I just said I love you in public and now you're exposing my wife. What's going on here? She wasn't making a full income for two years. Till now, my wife hasn't, hasn't worked a full school year because when she went back, again, the same jerk knocked her up and she had a second child and had to go on maternity leave again. So we were relying on EI, which is a fraction of what she's supposed to make. And even when she started working, I don't know if anyone knows how it works with teacher salaries, is that all of the, they get a lot of benefits, right? And it's, it's great. But the way it works is that the benefits gets deducted from their income. And if you had taken some time off, you still will not get your full income until you've kind of pretty much started again if, You've reintegrated yourself into the system. So she was never really making full salary till today as we speak. How am I still in the position that I am today? It's because of God. It's because of God. And I'm not here to, because I know tithing is a, divisive, is a divisive issue in the church. I'm not here to tell anyone, tithe. You have to die, tithe. Do what I do. I'm not here to do that. I'm just here to tell you that I 
as far as tithing goes, I've adopted a renewed mindset so much so that the connection I have with my father, the connection I have with my maker, you know, let me put it this way. After seeing and going back out of uh, seeing everything that I've been through from purchasing my home until now, the 10% I would have saved from not paying my tithe would have not saved me from the situations I went through. 10% could have done nothing for me. What are we talking about? It's a measly 10%. That's the least that I could have given God, given all that he's done for me. And again, this is my conviction. You don't have to adopt my conviction. I'm not here to, you know, again, I, I might not be here till next year. So, pastor, please take it easy on them next week, okay? But this is how I have renewed myself with my connection with my maker. Money for me, listen, we still, we, st we still go through financial trials. I'm not here to say that everything is honky-dory and rosy, whatever the case may be. We still have to, we still go through that. But as for me and my house, we will pay our tithes because we know that the 10% or whatever we decide to pay God is nothing compared to what God is capable of doing for us. His goodness, his righteousness, his mercy, his grace, his love far exceeds whatever monetary gain I can keep for myself. That's my conviction. So my ask for everyone today is connect forget about the law forget about because the thing about when we have discussions about are we allowed to do this are we allowed to do this is the, you know this was during old testament time can it be uh, uh, related to new testament time when we start to do that you know what we do we invoke our own knowledge we invoke our own will we invoke our own feelings into it and god doesn't call us to to to, to relate with him based on how we feel He's telling us to just strip ourselves of whatever secular or whatever fleshly duties that we may feel or obligations that we may have and just focus on him and be transformed and just relate with him. Christ himself said it. He said there's no greater love than a man to what? To lay down his life and die for his what? And what did he go and do after that? He went on the cross and did the exact same thing he, he, he said he would do. Why did he die? Because he's showing you that you are his friend. And what do you do with friends? You relate with friends. He's saying by my actions on going on the cross and dying for you, I'm, it's a call to relationship. If I just obey the law and its rigidity, I, can never be, I will never be able to get this revelation. I'm, I'm going to just speak to, the, to Toby, Isaiah, and so please correct me if I'm wrong if you've ever had this, these conversations with your wife. Have, has your wife ever you know, come to you and say, hey, babe, um, Miss Oma needs X, Y, and Z, Erin needs X, Y, and Z, or Salem needs X, Y, and Z? What's usually your immediate response when they ask, when they say things like this? Was I talking to you? <laughs> Let's hear from the fellas. Let's hear from the fellas. Let's hear from the fellas. Somebody, don't be shy. Don't worry. I, I, I don't worry. I'll protect you from your wife later if she wants to if she wants to say anything. Who, who, what's the answer? Toby, Nonso, Isaiah, anyone know the answer? What's your response? You're scared? Can you imagine? Uh, do we need this now? Huh? Do we need this now? We don't ask. It's up to you, big guy. No, no. That's, that's my response. Oh, that's your response. Do we need this now? And then what does she say? What does she say? After, and then now you're quiet. I mean. <laughs> All right, no worries. Typically, the, women will, the, the man will say, how much is it? And I'm sorry? Or is it needed? And what's the response? It's for the children. Okay, but is it needed? But it's for the children. Is it needed? I just bought this boy's shoes two weeks ago. How's he outgrown them already? <laughs> All right. And then for me, anyway, I respond, okay, is it needed? She says, yes, it is. And, then she, and I go, can we afford it? This is kind of pricey. What I usually say is, do we have the money for it? And Ellen would just say, yeah, we do. It's okay. I'll, I'll pay for it. I'll get it. Ellen, do you have the money for it? It's okay. It'll be done. Ellen, do you have the money? I said, I do. Are you sure? Because last time, we, I went over our books a couple weeks ago. I, we didn't budget for this. It's okay, Moyo, I have the money for it. I go to work, come back. There's a big Amazon box in my front porch, and it has my name on it for some reason. <laughs> And it's for the children. <laughs> Where am I going with this? And here's something I want to point out. My wife, when I met her, when we were courting, 
she was one of the most financially stable people. That's one of the things that actually drew me to her that I've ever met. She was so strong with her finances. She was able to save. She was able. To, she was very responsible. And I'm not saying she's irresponsible now, but when it comes to these two boys, it doesn't even matter. Money is not even an option. It's not even an option. Whatever they want, I'm getting it. I don't even care what's in the what's in the bank. She always gets it. Why was there a transformation? Because of the connection she has with her boys. She carried these boys for however how long. Gave birth to them connected with them, breastfed them, changed them, spends most of her days with them. There was a strong bond there that far exceeds whatever monetary need that they require. Uncle Rotem, you're awfully quiet. Is it, do you go through the same conversation as well? <laughs> he's not making eye contact. He's just like, you know. <laughs> so the connection is key. And in rounding up, I'm just going to, you know, there was, there was a great, um, and I forgot to get his name. I was listening to a message sometime this week, and there was something that the, uh, an example to, uh, that a pastor gave to kind of bring it home. He said that before he had a daughter, he received two speeding tickets for what? For being in a children's zone. He said, I, it's not that I didn't know the law. I just didn't know that I was speeding. He just, it just was not in the back of his mind. It was whatever. He got the first ticket, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. Now get this. He got the second ticket again. It do, again, it's not that he doesn't acknowledge or know the law. He's just not connected with the fact that you should be extra careful when driving in a school zone. And then he said when he gave birth to his daughter, he became the old guy yelling at everyone, saying, hey, slow down. You're in a kid's zone. Be careful. Why? The signs of your being in a kid's zone. The law of the fact that you were in a kid's zone did not transform him. Spiritually speaking, there was no connection to that law. He obeyed it, but he didn't connect with it. It was not until he had a daughter and related with this daughter and had a strong connection with this daughter that things had changed. He became a new creature. He was transformed <clears throat> and understood that it is vital that everyone that drives within the zone slows down. He found purpose in that law. That is what relationship does. You are meant to find purpose. You are meant to find a bond, get a strong bond, and you are meant to have a clean and good relationship with your maker to the point where so obeying the law becomes secondary in nature. You don't even care about what the law say. You just want to please your God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, and that rounds up today's message. Are we good? We good? Amen. Are we? Everyone, am I? Am I still your friend? Is everyone still okay with me? We're still good. Amen. Amen. All right. So that rounds up today's message. And um, God bless everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in today's um, service. And uh, again, the, the plaid shirts are incredible. You guys look fantastic. I see. I saw some blazers out there that were plaid. That's incredible. So um, in me just rounding up, let's just say a quick prayer. Um, dear Lord God, I just bless your holy name. I give you all the praise. I give you all the honor. I give you all the worship for today. I thank you for the beautiful message that was delivered today. I know that it's not by my own wisdom. It's not by my own word. It's not because of what I want to your people to hear this morning but rather what you want them to hear. And I ask that, Father, Lord God, for those who are, you know, who are still looking to transform their lives and, you know, commit themselves to you wholeheartedly, that you please place your hands upon their heart today, O oh Lord God, and touch them as Naomi sang at the conclusion of today's praise and worship set. Touch their hearts, O oh Lord God, this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Watch our services online. Visit rccgredemptionhouse.com and click on watch. If you have prayer points and testimonies, write us at share at rccgredemptionhouse.com Please send your suggestions, concerns, or questions to pastor at rccgredemptionhouse.com and that's it for the announcements. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the service.